class is on vines. In ground covers, erosion control, we'll touch on a lot of those. How to get vines to grow down a hill, up a hill, up a trellis, how many on a trellis, how many on a fence line. We're going to cover all the idiosyncrasies of vines. And so uh, it'll be a fairly short class, and I'll leave room for lots of questions. Okay, so maybe I'll talk 30 minutes. That's my plan always. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll take some Q&A stuff, okay? Uh, so that's my plan. And then mainly, how to get them to grow faster. How to plant them and how to push them. So if it's a brand new little uh, vine, how do you get it to actually take up space? So we grow a lot of just really nice vines. Let me just cover the ones we don't grow, okay? Bougainvillea, we're not gonna grow here. It just doesn't grow. It's too cold in the winter. It'll grow in the summer. So folks will put them in pots, they'll put them up in structures, you know, they'll, they'll bring them inside, they'll keep them in the garage, or they'll take them down to their home in the valley, but they're not, they can't winter over at this altitude up here. So that's the main one that we don't grow. We do grow most of the edibles, Black, uh, uh, blackberries, raspberries. You can actually treat those. I know they're technically a bramble, a huge bush with lots of tendrils, but you can really treat them, train them, much like a vine. So I've got those growing up my six foot cedar fence, just a big old long cedar fence, big backyard. It needed something. I wanted to feel garden-esque. And so I put every 15 feet or so, I put a, a trellis and I grew grapes, blackberries, raspberries. I just grew things sporadically. And then in between those 15 feet, I planted a shrub. Something that was more, that would not grow up against the fence, would be out a little bit further, give me some color. Sumax and butterfly bush. And that kind of stuff. So those are pretty much up against the fence? Yeah, the uh, vines are right up against the fence. Literally, I took a trellis and just leaned it against the fence. I wasn't very technical about it because no one's going to see the, fit, the, the trellis. But it wouldn't grow. Most of these won't grow, attach themselves directly onto a fence. They need something to grow up. The tendrils or they wrap around. Some vines will do that, some won't. Okay? So that's what I did. I just wanted to create this secret garden feel. So when you're back there, you just feel garden. I want that feel. I don't want to see the neighbors. I know your yard's beautiful. It's not as beautiful as my yard. I want to feel the hot tub. I want it to feel private, secluded, and uh, that kind of thing. So that, that's what I was trying to create. Um, so there, I planted it, and then I'm fertilizing. I'll show you how to plant and how to fertilize it to really get the growth. I'll really push it until it gets up the height, and then I'll kind of abuse it at that point. Just keep it healthy. Otherwise, some vines can take over. Some of these are quite aggressive. So you want to, and I'll go over which ones are most aggressive. So my house in Prescott Valley, there I had chain link fence. I don't like the look of chain link. It looks metal, looks like I'm directly from Russia. I mean, just like stark, hard, screams 1960s and 70s. I just, I wanted to soften that. And so there I grew vines every eight feet. Put them on eight foot centers, you know, your posts are at eight foot, typically. So I just planted one in the middle of each post. And then within a year, I had honeysuckle, silver lace vine, just whatever vine you like. Within a year, a good healthy vine will fill that eight by eight space. So this was six foot high by eight foot wide. So within no more than two, two seasons, it was filled in. And it looked like um, what I would do at that point, once it was up to, to, to say chain link or barbed wire, I've done the same thing. Had a barbed wire fence on Skull Valley. Had that home. You know, barbed wire is pretty. Not. I wanted to soften up with grapes and roses. There I just threw roses and the grapes down this very long driveway okay. with the farm. Plenty of seeds. I'm going to uh, Just to here. soften it up. So you turned the corner at the barn and came up to our house. You kind of went, oh. It just all changed. It felt good. So you wanted to go down this country lane, and that's the feeling that I wanted. Great. Uh, so there, every year I would just cut it right back to the fence. So I take my electric, or or or, or right now I have battery operated. Roby has a 40 volt battery operated hedger. It's the best tool ever because uh, you don't cut your cord anymore. So I just back it up. And I cut it back to the fence as close as I can without hitting the fence or the wire, whatever it is. And I'll just cut it back there. I'll fertilize it usually in the month of March. 
is the ideal month. Cut it back, fertilize it, and it will grow, flush out, come up with new growth. So vines like to be cut on. They need to be cut on. So really be aggressive with them. So that you can't kill them. So that cut it back by a third, like shrubbery and stuff, you ignore that rule of vines. You just really whack them. Okay? So really get it right back to the trellis, or the fence, or the, that, that where you're going. I did bring one arch, and it's kind of over here in the corner. Uh, let me just show you, because there's always a question, how many, can I take a vine and grow it up and over? Do I need two, do I need four? So this is a typical arch right here. We've got some with gates, we've got some that are narrower, wider, but generally speaking, this is a pretty common metal arch. Here with that type of arch, let's say it's gonna go into your house, the back patio, or through a fence line, there, I would take my favorite vine, whatever it is. We'll go over those. I plant one on this side and one on the other side. Let's say clematis. I pick a yellow and a purple clematis and I grow them up on each side. It's very, very difficult to get a vine to grow up this, and some folks want to grow it back down. Vines don't like to grow down. They only want to grow to the sky. You can train them, you gotta force them, but it's really difficult to do that. So it's better to plant one on each side. Now some folks want to, they go, I don't want to wait. I'm American, I've got money. I'm gonna, I want it now, I want it grow, I want it to be in my, my head now. And they'll plant four, one on each post. I think that's a bit too much. Yes, it will fulfill the picture faster, but it'll be more maintenance than probably you want. I would, for me, I would just plant one on each side Grow. If it's a pergola, a lot of pergolas, you know, usually you've got four posts for this lattice work or different artistic uh, structures that way. There I would plant one on each post and it will grow up and I've done that with, with grapes. It's wonderful. It screams Italian, villa. It's very beautiful. The grapes will hang down underneath the, the, the trellis work. It's beautiful. Um, it just, but I put one on each of those posts. Typically they're eight by eight or 10 by 10. It's pretty standard pergola measurements. There I'll put one on each one. I'll train it to go up the post, form it to go over, and, and then call it good. Um, I also don't take it back to the ground every year. I, we aren't, this is not commercial farming. This is backyard beauty is what it is. So you can blend a lot of the stuff you'll, you'll read on the internet, they're talking commercially. This is what you do commercially. This is not this group. This is backyard beauty with some commercial. And I find there's a lot more fudge factor. You can have beauty and grapes too. You don't have to cut it back to four feet main trunk and grow it out because we're not trying to maximize the bottle harvest on a Cabernet vine to get as many grapes as we can to get as many bottles. We're not into that. You can have beauty and you can have the structure. So there I just, let's say I'm growing it up, a pergola, grapes. I'll grow up to the top. I'll let it grow over the over that top area so I get the shade to it in the summer. And then I'll leave it. I don't cut it back all the way back down to four foot. So kind of watch. That's one, if you're not quite sure, come talk to us. I go, well, yes, that's how the book says to do it, but I would probably leave the main trunk up, maybe thin it back, but leave the main structure intact. There, that way I get my shade with the feeling right off the bat in the spring, as soon as it leaves out. So I've grown grapes up two and a half stories and come out and I still had grapes. So it's, it, there's a lot of forgiveness on this stuff. So, so kind of watch what you're reading and intaking because you're tweaking that to be backyard, not just commercial. Most of the information you see is this farmers posting stuff. This is how the book told you to do it in, in ag school. But we're not in ag school, we're in backyard fun garden, okay? Should we go over how to plant and then we'll go over some plants? So how to actually get the most growth out of things? So let's go with this, this typical, let's go with this one. This is called a five gallon bucket. This is a one gallon. Let's see where the vine that I've got. I don't know where they get it from. This is a one gallon bucket. I think it goes back, when you talk to my father-in-law, he used to deal with coffee cans. 
They were metal cans that have canned butters. You couldn't just slip them out. So there, I think they were more true gallons. True, they were more true to their. Now it's this is uh, point whatever. They've got it actually measured, but the standard, the way you call it, one gallon just means oh, it's a small bucket. <laughs> That's all it means. The five gallon is this size, generally speaking. Trees and larger shrubs are, are grown in this size bucket. So when you're planting, and some of you, in mountain soils can be really bad. So some of you are gonna plant, especially where you wanna put vines, where you plant vines seems to be even worse. Because you're putting it back on that rock face, down at the base where all the crumbling granite's going, and you wanna plant there and grow it up. Where it's in the back corner where the contractor is throwing all of his junk and you want to kind of try to hide that debris pile and it's back there where you normally don't go but I hate seeing that huge trailer with you know someone bought a class A motorhome and they think it's beautiful but it's right there on your property line and it's not so beautiful from your back from your bedroom or your living room you, you kind of want to grow things to kind of hide that so many times vines are where it's not ideal so, you're going to dig a hole only as deep as the bucket. That's it. You don't have to go down the china. Just really shallow is good, especially for vines. Vines do not send a taproot down at all. They, go, they, go, they have roots that go sideways. That's how they naturally grow. So the roots are going to come out this way. They're not going to go down. So if you know that's how a vine is going to grow, dig the hole wide. So dig it, loosen up the side soil. Don't go, don't loosen up the, de the, the deep, don't go deep. Okay, trust me, this will really work. And then kind of saucer shape. Much easier to dig a hole that's shallow than, than real deep. Um, now, if you've got a real hard area where rocks and debris, chunks of roots, old two by fours, I just found bricks that the contractor had buried in my yard. So I, I dug into those and went, oh man, where'd that come from? I didn't see that. They were burying the trash out in the yard, trying to cut costs. Very common practice. You never know what you're gonna see when you start digging. Anything that's bigger than a golf ball, thin that outer screen, so screen the, the, that, that soil, so that when you backfill, it's gonna be nice, it's gonna be soil, not rocks and debris. A rock will simply heat up in summer and roast it'll bake the roots. So you do want to screen that out, okay? But the last, last grass I planted, I had more, I, I filled the five gallon bucket up with just chunks of stuff. There was that much in the soil. So there, I just kind of watched that. Um, then you want to add some organic matter, some compost, some mulch. And here we, we make a product here, this is called, Premium mulch, it's just compost. It's an old water, yeah, water's premium mulch. It's an old sawmill over in Taylor, Arizona. We harvest the old saw, sawdust tailings. And we bag it up, so it's locally sourced. It's screened down to be really fine. It's made to amend our native soil so the roots of the plants can get through that dirt. If you don't do that, what will happen is that soil will compact right back down to its hard state within one watering. One time, one, you water it once, the gravity just, and that weight of the water just gets it packed out, and now the roots have a difficult time getting down through that soil. So it keeps the soil aerated, is what it does. And it adds organic, so the birds, the worms, mycorrhizal fungi, the living things in the soil, they like hanging out there. If the soil seems to be alive and active, the plant goes, whoa, something's going on here. I, I want a root, this is gonna be a great place to grow they start sitting off roots. So that'll be your most important thing. You want about 25% mulch to your, so to your native soil, or about one scoop of mulch to three scoops of native earth. It makes sense to blend that together. And that blend is what you're gonna backfill around this, this root ball. Then you water it in it'll look really good. There you go, that's it. Um, I do actually add to mine we recommend you sprinkle some all-purpose plant food. This is an organic fertilizer. So before I water things in, I'll sprinkle a handful of this at the recommended rate um, around the roots. And then, and then that, as this melts or breaks down or, or dilutes, it'll feed that, the new, new roots and feed the vines. It'll grow faster for you. 
so it'll take better for you. It kind of has an earthy smell to it, and has this organic y smell because it is organic y. It's, it's kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I will water it in, at least the first watering with root and grow. This is a transplant shock. Now, this is the only home this plant has ever known. And it's like open heart surgery. No, it's like brain surgery and open heart surgery at the same time. When you pull this plant out of the bucket, put it in, new, in your crummy soil, it's going to go into shock, guaranteed. How much shock is the question. So this is kind of like an antibiotic or, or, or it stimulates, it's, it's, a, it's a rooting hormone. Gets it to root and start taking. So usually I'll use this every other week until I see the plant stabilized. Once I see new growth, certain relief, and I go, oh, it's happy. Then I'll cut it off of this. I'll stop adding this to my water can, adding that to my water. But every two weeks or so, I'll add this on until I know it's happy in the new spot that I, that I put it in. If you do that, you're gonna have a happy plant that will sort of take off from new growth. It'll root quickly. Now, a lot of vines come with these, these bamboo canes or some sort of structure that we're growing it up. There, I, I'll get it all planted first, then I will take these out. I'll take these rubber bands off, or however it's tied, and then I'll start taking these vines and I'll, I'll spread it out and I'll start to train it to go where I want it to go. Don't let a vine grow where it wants to grow. It will be very unruly. You gotta train it. So there you got you wanna purposely force it to go in the direction that you want it to go in. Otherwise it gets a wild hair. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. But take these bamboo stakes off and then tie it to the fence or the structure, the wire that you're training it up. Purple post, whatever it is. For me, I use tie tape. Did I bring some of that? I thought I did. Yeah, there right here. I use this, uh, it's called tie tape or super tie. It's a half inch width. Now it comes in one inch and half inch. For my vines, I use the smaller. It's just easier to work with. But yeah, it's the uh, one inch is mainly for trees, that kind of stuff. This is more for vines, perennials, flowers, that kind of stuff. So I use this. I'll just train it, very inexpensive, very easy to use. I always have some of this in the garden shed. Just something you need to have. It's a good tool to have. Now, I don't generally use wire or some of the other stuff you naturally have in the garage because it can girdle. As the wind blows, it'll rub up against that wire or rope or, or, or twine. It'll rub and it'll cut or girdle that tender new uh, vine that's going up. So you'll find the wider tape is it's much, much more effective. Yeah. Uh, that's some things. Now, if you're growing up a trellis, you'll use the, the tie tape. If you're growing up, let's say, a rock face, some of you have that dugout home, or you've been to friends' houses where you go out their back patio and it's just this rock face, straight up. So dug it out, kind of gone that way. Well, that's a great place for vines. Now, I don't really want a trellis there, I just want it to grow into the face of that, that cutout burn, whatever it is. Um, let's say I've got erosion, water's just coming through and it's washing out, let's say a, a slight knoll, that rock uh, uh, with, the, with the soil, boulders and stuff, it's washing all that up. I want vines to grow up through that area. There, I use these garden staples. This is really made for fabric, keeping that weed fabric down, or for irrigation, we'll keep the half inch line into the ground. I found this makes really great vine supports in the ground. Let's say you want to train it to go up through a rock, through a couple boulders, you want it to go that way. I'll, I'll train that, I'll, I'll take these bamboo posts off, I'll lay it on the ground, point it the right direction, I'll pin it with these pins. These are just huge staples about this long. I'll just staple it right to the ground. So it forces it to stay in place. If you don't do that, javelina will come in and reroot it, the wind will blow, it'll be over here. It'll just be all over the place, it'll be unruly. This makes it go where you want it to go. So it's, it's uh, personal experience has worked really well. I get tired of these, these plants doing what they want to do. I'm a gardener, 
I'm training you to do what I want you to do. You're not allowed to just jump through the hoop of like, oh, flaming hoops. I want plants to jump through flaming, flaming hoops. That's kind of how I force them to do that, okay? That's how you plant, that's, that's it. It's really, I made it more complicated to add a couple extra caveats, depending on where you're planting them. Uh, but again, about eight foot spacings, a vine will fill in a space very, very quickly up to head high, and you can train it to go higher. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get my hops. Uh, I've got a, a plane with hops. You know, like beer hops, like you flavor beer, home brew. Uh, I'm growing hops in a pot on the back patio, two stories high, and then across a trellis or across a railing from my deck. It's magnificent trying to finish it, get it a little bit fuller and in full bloom, and I'll take a picture or video or something to show it off. So if you're, on, you're part of our garden club, you get our emails, you'll see that coming your way here probably in September sometime. It'll be at its max beauty. I don't want to see, I want it to be perfect. So there's some pressure there to show it off. But it's impressive. People come in the backyard, see it in the deck, they go, wow, where did that come from? What is that? What is that? It's got all the flowers to it. It's a beautiful plant, like you said. Beautiful plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, shall we go down the, the vines? And I just picked a few. I don't have a lot of the early spring bloomers kind of stuff. This is the ones you see in summer. Probably the most famous right now is this guy. And it's been in blue. Um, this is, you'll see a flower about this big tubular shaped hummingbirds are all over it called trumpet vine. That's trumpet vine. It's a native, drop hardy, comes in yellow, comes in orange, comes in red. Mainly the orangey one's the most popular. Very aggressive vine. You don't want to put that on a little trellis. This, you want to be, this is on the side of a building, like a skyscraper. It would fill it up. <laughs> so it's a big, aggressive vine. Yep. Once those trumpet vines get established, do they need Good question. So this question was for the folks in the back or, or watching online, if he's got a trumpet vine already established, do you need to water it or how, how much care does it take? What I do for mine is I'll, I'll put it on my tree drip irrigation. I'll treat it just like a tree. If I'm watering my trees every 10 days, it'll do just fine with that. If you really want it to bloom and be beautiful, you'll need to fertilize it and water it sporadically. So, and you're planting that for that big flower. You have a pie college, it's famous. If you've driven by, you have a pie college. You, anywhere on the campus, they have a lot of trumpet pines. And they're all in bloom right now. They grow them up structures, as bushes, all kinds of stuff. So they're very, very pretty. Yes? Do you need to train them, or do they adhere to a building? Because we just stuck out our house, and my husband will have a fit if I have those little things all no. over the house. So, do you, what do you, how does it grow up? It does not itself attach itself. Yeah. So good, for stucco, it's not gonna like a like an ivy. This guy right here, this guy's notorious for sticking on the buildings, self-adheres, doesn't need any kind of help. It will do it itself. It will come through the building. It will make breakfast for itself. It will climb in bed with you. It is an aggressive vine. It goes through it every place. So it attaches itself. So it's good where you can control it some. Where I use this one because I don't want the headache. I don't want it getting into my stucco. This one I actually put into structures. So I've got those English balls, pyramid, you know, the metal structures. It does really well with that. It's classic for that. The, the uh, trumpet vine does not adhere, does not self-attach. So there you need a trellis or something for it to grow up, wires for it to grow up. Also, which vines are more animal resistant? Animal, let's cover that as we go down the list. Right. Uh, nothing eats ivy. <laughs> it's a great plant. So it is. A, there's a right place for it. Now, I find ivy does not do that well in the sun. It prefer, it'll, it'll take sun, a lot of sun. But I find it does best or looks ideal. It looks perfect. East exposure north to west exposure that direct sun where it's in full blistering hot all the time it can get a little burned looks a little rough especially midsummer in june so i find it does better where it's got a little protection uh trumpet vine nothing eats that so it seems to be bulletproof that way 
Let's just go down the line. <coughs> this is uh, Silver Lace Vine. Again, it's one of those native-y, drought-hardy, tough-as-nail kind of plants. If you've got really, let's say, zero-scape kind of landscapes, this is the one you want to go with. Because you can't kill it. I mean, this is, if you're a landlord, you've got tenants, you live in your house, not you. Someone that's maybe not gardener-like, this is the one you want to plant. Because you just can't, you can abuse this and still it will bloom every summer with these beautiful white flowers that flow down. It's magnificent. It is deciduous. That is, it'll lose its foliage in the winter, but it's tough, it's just really a tough little plant. Very aggressive growing. So this is the one you really want to cut back hard on your on your uh, on your plants. Silver lace vine. Ivy we've already covered. It's a slow grower, but it's methodical. It's just always growing all the time. Nice evergreen. Again, there's a place for it. Just keep it maintained. You can't plant it and just let it go. It's going to take some maintenance. This thing keeps going to me too. I tell you what. If you give me your email, I'll make sure when I take that picture of my, my uh, um, yeah, hops, I'll make sure you get a personal, you get first dibs on the, on the video. I'll email it to you. Just, it'll be a link, I'll probably upload it to YouTube and just send, send the link out. So it'll probably be me giving a personal tour of my garden. Hey, let me show you this hops. Isn't it magnificent? It's really impressive. It's really odd. It's right. There's two of them covering this huge deck. Really pretty. Yeah. When will the beer be ready, though? Yeah. <laughs> okay, honeysuckle. Honeysuckle is probably the most famous of all of our, our our vines. We use it as ground covers to soften up rock faces. We use it up trellises. We use it a, a lot of places. Animals don't eat it. It blooms every spring with that very fragrant honeysuckle color, flavor, smell, it just has a lot going for it. It's tough. Animals, I mean deer, javelina, rabbits, nothing eats it. So it's a great plant. It looks delicate, I know, but it's a really great plant for the mountains of Arizona. Again, spring bloomer. And then as you see, as you look around, if you see these little tags, this means we don't want to winter it over. We want you to take it home. This has got a great value price on it. So for sale price, please look for the tag. It's called the Monsoon Sale. Take those home. It's a great time to keep planting vines. This is probably one that you put your grandparents used. That's an old-fashioned vine. I think we need to reintroduce it. This is called Pyracantha. Um, it has a white flower in spring. It gets a, a, an orange berry. You see the berries. The flowers are starting to form berries. These will turn orange or red, depending on the variety that it, that it is. And it will keep those berries on right through winter. Very, very pretty, almost ornamental. It's, it's evergreen, and animals don't bother it. The birds love it. In fact, they love it when the berries start to ferment, and they'll have a party on this thing. They'll be stumbling around drunk as they're eating these berries that have fermented on the vine. And so this one, they, there's a couple varieties of pyrocanthus. There's shrub varieties. This is a vining, or very large variety. So if you want it to grow up a wall or up a fence, use, use this variety, okay? Then do those berries stain the concrete? So do the berries stain the concrete? I don't know. I would say don't leave them where you step on them or you can get some, some stuff. I've got one customer who makes pyracantha wine or brandy or what do you call it? He ferments the berries. Uh, really? You can do that? Really? I thought they were for the birds. Uh, grapes. I think we, we underestimate grape. grapes. You can use grapes in a lot of different ways. And it has that Mediterranean kind of look. And there are some native varieties of grapes. They do so well at this elevation, they grow wild. They don't fruit very well. I think that if you're going to do it, have a table grape or something you can actually eat. But uh, this one happens to be a Catawba which is a nice purple seedless variety, but Thompson's grow, Emeralds, uh, the rose, or lighter colored reds. <coughs> Grapes do really, really well. And again, when you see this little vine, it just kind of says, find me, take me home. 
This is a thornless boysenberry. Again, not technically truly a vine, but I find I can grow it easily up about a six foot trellis. And I, if I intertwine it in between all the trellis work, it can look like a vine. It gets, gets large enough. The negative with brambles is they also get wide. So vines are a little easier to keep narrow. This one you'll have to cut back to the fence or to your trellis more often. But boy, does it produce berries. I mean, I've been picking berries, huge berries, for over a month. Just, I'm like, I'm tired of eating berries. And they're free. When you go in your own yard, you buy them at Costco, like 10 bucks for a, for a oh, that's your bushel or whatever. Uh, anyone know what this is? Folks from California probably know. Kiwi. This is a hardy variety of kiwi. It actually will form little fruits on it. Not as big as you're, you're used to. It will actually, it's a beautiful plant. It'll also form little fruits. It's just something that's off the radar for most folks. The kiwi, kiwi will also grow here. There's basically the, vine, the vines. There's a lot more clematis. Clematis grows magnificently here. I think every yard should have at least one. And they come in every shape and color you can think of. And here's how I plant clematis. I love growing it um, on a vine, but by itself it can be a little wispy. So I always companion plants with things like, I bring a, I didn't bring my favorite one, but uh, let's say this with this, this would companion plant. I'll plant these together in the same hole or side by side or right next to each other and I will grow them into each other so that yes this is a pretty flower but that's not nearly as pretty as that when you put them together they look really really good clematis looks really good grown into other shrubs or into other vines oh this is the one I was looking at this is my favorite this is called uh, five leaf akibia you may not know what this vine is. It's an evergreen vine. It's pretty aggressive. I like it because it grows fast. It's evergreen. Animals don't eat it. And when you grow this thing in a, up, up with it, grow, grow with it, this has a flower that's very fragrant, but insignificant. You can't see it. You're planting it for the foliage. This has a flower, but the foliage is rather insignificant. So when you put them together, you get these pretty companions that grow together. Uh, yeah, just as well. Uh, Akibia, A-K-E-B-I-A, Akibia. And you can look at the tag when you come back. But this is a great plant. I've grown this at every home, Prescott Valley, right out in the wind, did great. Skull Valley, right where the elk roamed, right there. Uh, they, the elk didn't eat it, the deer didn't eat it, it just grew. I've grown it in shade, grown it in sun. It's a very versatile plant. Just make sure you got your hedge pruners sharp because you don't want to turn it back every once in a while. This one, the secret with clematis, make sure the roots are shaded and the tops can grow into the sun. This likes to be in the sunshine. So what I'll do is typically I'll take some of this shredded cedar bark, this uh, shredded bark, and I'll top dress the roots of my clematis specifically. All vines are going to like that, but, specific, but clematis are going to need it. If you do that, you will have the most magnificent clematis. I mean, if the neighbors will come over and be awestruck by how green your thumbs are. Yes? I'm used to spring flowering clematis. Is that the summer variety? There's summer, autumn, and spring. There's many different clematis, and we grow them all here. So you can pick which ones you like really how people buy clematis they go ooh i like red it's like candy you just buy the red one the purple one the white one my favorite's a montana so it's a flower this big pure white it's like, it's well, I, I jack it okay jack one that'll that'll grow here as well yeah a lot of different we'll probably have 30 different varieties of clematis that cycle through the different seasons in the back aren't some of the clematis don't have to be cut down and then others have to be left alone. So do you need to cut back clematis to the ground? No, you do not. I keep them up to structure. How much pruning? Um, how much pruning on clematis specifically? I'll just prune it back to 
the structure. All of these vines prune back to the structure. I'll leave the main structure intact. It'll look kind of dead. I mean, it's no leaves, just, just vines. I'll water it through winter and then once a month, a couple times a month. Fertilize is the key thing. We should touch on how to fertilize vines. They're more, they, they need more food. How did, I, how did I get a hops to grow two stories and then cross a railing? That's no small feat. You're gonna have to fertilize pretty often to do that. Let me tell you what I did. I did two things. One, I used this all-purpose plant food, this organic food. This is like, uh, this is sort of like the Vegas buffet with the ribeye rib steak and unlimited shrimp added to it. That's what this is. It's like, I am so stuffed, I don't know what to do with myself. This is that kind of food. Okay, this is steak and potato, hardcore, slow release. Every time you irrigate or it rains, releases some food every time over a very long period of time. This is your main fertilizer for things that grow fast. Now, I did this every other month, steak and potato, but vines, they love a Snickers bar every once in a while, or an ice cream bar. They like a snack. They like to kind of, they like to eat. And so there, I also put down my flower power right here. Every other week, so every two months, I give them this. Every two weeks, I give them the flower power especially blooming things, or you want it to grow amazingly fast. So every two weeks in a container, it's in a pot. I had to grow it two stories and across the railing in a pot. That's no small feat. In the ground, it would be easier. Uh, but I did this every two weeks, and this is a water-soluble food. So you mix it in your watering can. I just kind of go around. I just make my plants happy with this. Makes me feel better, makes my plants feel better. Uh, whereas this, I just sprinkle it around and forget. I forget that I did it. This is more deliberate. So my container, flowering stuff, uh, my flowering, uh, just flower, perennials, uh, vining things, especially though, this, this really, really works. That program, you'll have amazing vines, amazing. I use flower power if I, even if I, grow, if I want it to grow fast. So my grapes, um, in the ground, not as much. In pots, definitely. In the ground, I'm kind of a lazy gardener. It's hard for me. I have so many plants. I don't do this for everything. If I'm going to have a party, let's say the family's coming over, I'm going to have guests or special invites. Yes, about two weeks before the party, I'll go do this. Just so everything's in full bloom, full glory, full color, full. But I generally don't do this in the ground that often. Okay? I do this as my main... This is my main food for everything. This is something I've been perfecting for a lot of years, and it really, really works. So, okay, with that, we're done with the vine topics. Questions? Yeah. So, June sun. How hard on it is on vines, specifically clematis? All of these guys will do fine in the sun, except the ivy, this one will tend to fry. Clematis does fine. So you might have to bump your watering up just a touch, but again, you're insulating the soil with a two, three inch layer of mulch. The soil is not gonna dry out, especially in clematis. So I use a lot of shredded bark in my yard. I, I use probably 10, 15 bags a year just to keep things healthy. Yes? Question, I've got a real good sand probably 50 feet wide of bucket vine on my back. Nice. Doing great. It's difficult to get water up there, so I'm thinking it'd be difficult to get a plant new up there. Can you kind of train existing on the north side? Oh, of good question. So he's got a 50 foot row of trumpet vine, and he doesn't want to water and care for it. Just he wants to train it what it is. He wants to force it to go in the direction to fill out more. How do you do that? There, I would. I mean, that thing's it's old and established, which is yeah. great. It makes it robust. It's got roots going everywhere. Um, there I fertilize it in, in, okay. uh, in October. I fertilize that in October. I do it again in March or April, whenever I start to see it wake up. But meanwhile, about the New Year's, I would Thank butcher you. that thing. I would cut it back to the fence line 
so that it doesn't want to grow this way out. It's just going to grow sideways down the fence some more, especially on the ends. And if you fertilize it like that, it will wake up in the spring and just be ferocious on how it grows. It'll, it'll, you could probably take it another 20 feet in both directions if you did that. And just trim it back, not right back, but just where it's comfortably where you have to risk hitting that chain link. And it'll, it'll hurt you to do that. Yeah. But don't worry, you can't kill trumpet pine. You can't do it. So, yeah. Oh, very good question. So she wants to grow vines. Vines are generally larger plants. So what size pot would I want to use for a vine? Now I'm growing hops. I've got hops and then some flowers at the front edge. So it's a big pot. About this big around, about that deep. I mean, it's a huge patio. It mainly the pot had to fit the, the patio space and it feels dwarfish. Or, gosh, what, they ran out of money? They couldn't afford the big one? It needed a resort size pot. It needed something substantial. And so mine was, was pretty big. I got matching colors and then I'm growing it up that, that way. I would say the minimum size for these vines would be probably 18 inch. I say bigger is better, but 18 inch, about 18 inch deep. That'd be minimum size. And that will get you probably years out of a vine if you did that. For mine, um, hops comes back every year if I'm happy with it. I'm pretty happy. You'll see how it does. There, I'm gonna plan on growing it for several years, maybe 10 years. I do get bored with plants, so I will transplant you just because I'm gonna have done it. I'm done with you. I'll rip it out and put a new one in. Just because, and it's still alive. I just, I'm a gardener. I like playing with plants. And so I'll switch them out of once in a while. I find you can get about seven to ten years out of most plants in a pot. And finally, they kind of get tired. They don't. They don't have that robust look. They don't. They don't have the vigor that they had before. No matter how much you fertilize, they just lose the energy. Or when they start to get barky and woody. So many many of these plants will get a thick bark. Junipers are notorious for this. Pyracantha, Ketoniaster. They'll have nice green on the ends, but the inside is just wispy and thin, and it looks old. Looks like it's just tired. That's my cue, okay? Old and tired doesn't fit my yard. Out of here. Fresh, young, vibrant rock stars. That's what I want. You can be on the front of a magazine. You're welcome. If you're on the front of Ark or something, no. You're, no that's, that's just different. I'll change them out. Uh, next thing you work with chemical composition is in that flat fork. Well, I, can, I can read 744. Oh, yeah, this is 744. Yeah. This is 105410. So it's all phosphorus. 1054. Yeah, so it's, it's as high as I could go on the phosphorus without and still keep it liquid. How about the flat fork one that you can transplant? Oh, 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 yeah, this one is, yeah. uh, this one's 4103. Does it help you? Kind of, but yeah, yeah, vitamin B, B12. Actually, some real quick history. Uh, the B1 is what they used to use. B1, remember? Your, your parents and grandparents used B1. What we found in some university testing, we tried water, B1, and some of these rooting, rooting hormone stuff. There was no difference in the plant root structure between B1 and water. It was basically water repackaged and sold said, hey, this sold, they made you, they sold you a five dollar bottle of something that really changed the pH a little bit, that was it. But when you started adding a mild fertilizer and a rooting hormone to it, all of a sudden the root structure was twice the size. So as soon as we saw that, we went, okay, B1 is out, we no longer sell that. That's been a, a myth. We're gonna sell the better stuff, which is kind of why people shop at Waters anyway. But this one actually does help form larger roots and transplant shop makes a difference. I brought things back from the dead. How about I could get this hat to grow? If I just poured this on. Maybe it'll help my hair thinning so bad. I don't know. Start shampoo with that. Anyway, okay, we're we're how we digress. Uh, with that we've got uh, vines. I'll hang out. You can come up and take a look at the labels and uh, take a look at all the, the ribbons. Those are all months and they're all sale priced. Uh, on plants. So thanks you all for, for coming. You can clap now. Yeah.